Welcome to Money Matters with Karen Ford, where you will learn methods and manners for increase to help you move from financial bondage to financial freedom. Hello, I'm Karen Ford and welcome to Money Matters. Over the last two weeks, we looked at prosperity and the foundation of prosperity. And today, we're gonna look at God's plan for prosperity. Did you know that God has a plan for man? He has a plan for us to be prosperous. If you'll turn with me, please, Genesis 13, two, it says that Abraham was rich in cattle, silver, and gold. In fact, Bible scholars say that Solomon was the richest man in the world. Historians say that there was so much silver in Israel that it was like stones in the street. So we see prosperity, but many people question themselves and say, well, does God really want us to prosper? You know, years ago, people... uh, you know, and maybe sometimes they're still thinking that today. Well, I see it's happening in the Word of God, but does God want me to be prosperous? Well, let's see what the Word of God says about that. Joshua 1, 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it both day and night, that you may observe to do all that is written in it. Then you will make your way prosperous and have good success. So we see here that God wants us to be prosperous. He just said that in Joshua. Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. Psalm 1 says that that we are going to be like trees planted by streams of water who yields fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. And whatsoever we do shall prosper. And then 3 John 2, beloved, I pray that you may prosper and be in health even as your, your soul prospers. So we see that God's word He says he wants us to prosper. He wants that. So it is for today. But there's a promise of prosperity, a process of prosperity, and then there's a purpose of prosperity. And those are the three things that we're going to look at today. But first of all, we must first determine what exactly is prosperity? What does that look like? What's the definition? Well, in the Hebrew, that word prosperity is a word salak. And it means to progress, to advance, to succeed, and to push forward. You know, we may be attaining things on our own, and then all of a sudden, God's going to advance us. He's going to push us forward. He's going to cause us to succeed. He's going to move us, move us forward in our marriages so that our marriages are prosperous. He's going to move us forward in our relationships so that our relationships prosper. He's going to move us, uh, push us into success in our workplace so that uh, we're successful and Uh, prosperous in our workplace. And then he's going to push us forward and succeed in the area of finances. See, God wants us to prosper in every arena of our lives. So God does want us to walk in prosperity. He wants us to have that. So we see the, the definition of prosperity. So does God's word really promise all of us that we can be prosperous? Does God promise that we can walk in prosperity? Absolutely. How, where does he show this to us? He showed us this in the Garden of Eden. What? Way back in Genesis? Yeah. The places that we see the promise of prosperity is he showed us in the garden and he saved us on the cross. God's plan for man is revealed in the Garden of Eden so that we would have a picture of our lives if we would obey his word. Look at Genesis 1, verses 26 through 29. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the cattle and all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Did you know you have authority over creeps? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them 
And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, listen, God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. This is a picture of prosperity that God desires for us. Let's look at a few words here. He said he blessed them. We're empowered to have the ability to prosper, to progress, to advance, to succeed, to be pushed forward. If you're a child of God watching this today, this is his plan that he wants for us to reside in. He wants us to be fruitful. That means to increase. God created us to increase. Psalm 115 says we are to increase more and more, we and our children. See, God's a generational God. He doesn't just want it for us, uh, us four and no more. No, he's a generational God. He wants you and I to walk in prosperity and he wants our children to walk in prosperity, our grandchildren to walk in prosperity all the way down the line. <clears throat> then he says he wants us to subdue it. He tells Adam and Eve, I want you to subdue the earth. This means if something gets out of line, we have the authority to put it back. And in verse 29, the Amplified says that we are to use all of its vast resources in the service of God and man. See, all that Adam knew was prosperity. That's all he knew before the fall. God set up the Garden of Eden so that we would have a picture of our lives if we would obey his word. In the Garden of Eden, all their needs were met without sweat. <laughs> All their needs were met without sweat. Am I saying that God doesn't want us to work? No, 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 no. He set up work. He told them to subdue it. He told them to tend the garden. That was before sin ever entered. That's before they ever fell. Work is good. God made us to work. God gave man work to do. But he wants us to walk in prosperity. God designed Adam's, Adam's environment. While Adam slept, fresh vegetation was growing up all around him. He set up that environment. Could it be that God has designed an environment for us that we're not living in? We need to get back over there. We need to get back over there. Some might be watching this today and say, well, you know, sin entered. You know, we're not in Eden now, so how can I walk in prosperity? How can I walk in prosperity? He showed us in the Garden of Eden, but then he showed us Jesus. He saved us on the cross. Can I tell you that prosperity wasn't just for the Old Testament? It wasn't just for Adam. See, God made Adam and then he sinned. But then the second Adam came and he restored us. He saved us from sin. He saved us from sickness. He saved us from poverty. God's plan for us is prosperity. It's not good for us to have. I mean, you know, why would he give it to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Solomon, David? All of them walked in prosperity. Revelation 5.12 says, Worthy is the Lamb who is worthy to receive power, riches, and wisdom. If we're in Christ, we are heirs and joint heirs. Glory to God. Galatians 3 verses 27 through 29 says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We have a promise of prosperity. That's the promise that God has for you and for me today. But there's a process for you and I to walk in prosperity. See, there's the promise of prosperity. God wants us to be prosperous.
but there's a process to walk it out. And I'm going to give you four ways, four ways to walk out that process of prosperity. First of all, there's seek. We must seek him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. How are we to seek him? We're to seek him first. When we get up of the morning, we need to seek him first. We need to place him first in our lives. And what happens? He will add all these things unto us. What are the things? Housing, clothing, bling, bling. All of that stuff is going to be added unto us as we seek him first. We must seek him. When we get paid, how do we seek him first? We tithe. We heard that two weeks in a row now. We seek him first by placing him first with the finances that we make. Why? Genesis 2, verse 9 and 17, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Look at verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. See, God told Adam, you're going to have all of your needs met. You can have this whole garden. But see, tithing was back in the garden. He said, you can eat any of these trees, but don't touch that tree. That tree is mine. That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That tree was the tithe. That tree was God's. That tree, Adam and Eve, were not to touch. And what did he say? He says, the day that you eat of that, you shall surely die. What's the very first thing the devil does? The devil comes in, slithers in, and he gets them to eat God's portion. Because the devil knows the day that you eat God's portion is the day that you have to leave that place, that place of prosperity that place of prosperity. The tree is divine portion. See, the tithing wasn't just in the New Testament. The tree, the tithing wasn't just in the Old Testament with Abraham tithing to Melchizedek. The tithe actually was in the Garden of Eden because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was God's tithe. God says, I will never curse you, but the day that you eat of this tree, you're going to be cursed. Eating of this tree will push you out of the place of blessings. You and I can be pushed out of the place of blessings when we eat the tithe, when we don't tithe. Their discipline over that one tree was how they were going to show their love to God. Our discipline over tithing shows our love to God. Can I tell you that the devil wants you to eat God's portion? If we tithe, If we eat the tithe, if we consume the tithe, the Bible says that we're cursed with a curse. God God never said that he would curse us. He said, you're voluntarily placing yourselves under a curse when you don't tithe. Oh, brothers and sisters, we have to seek him first. And seeking him first is not just seeking him in prayer when we wake up of a morning, but it's also seeking him first in our finances by returning the tithe. So how do we get out of the place of the curse? The way to break the curse is to tithe. We tithe to the local church. We bring him honor. We bring it on the first day of the week. We tithe it to the local church and that's, and that helps break that curse. So there's a, we have a purpose. We have a purpose for prosperity. We have a place of prosperity and The process of prosperity is to begin by seeking. The other process of of walking in prosperity is not only to seek, but also to sow. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who owned a field and sent his servants into his field to sow seed into the field. God is teaching us kingdom principles here. The kingdom operates a lot like a garden. We sow seed, it yields a harvest. You know, sowing and reaping, it's a no-brainer, really. If we sow a seed, if I sow an apple uh, apple seed today, am I going to get an apple tree tomorrow morning with that's full-grown with, you know, ripe apples on it? No, there's a process to it. I may plant that apple seed 
And after a few years, I, that tree is going to be nice size and it's going to start bearing apples, right? Well, it's the same way in the kingdom of God. We can't expect to sow a seed today and all of a sudden we have a full grown harvest tomorrow. It's seed, time, harvest. So we seek him and then we sow. God is teaching us kingdom principles. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You are most assured that whatever you sow is going to grow. Sow it in faith and it's going to reap. What are you going to sow? Well, anything above a tithe you can sow. The tithe is not something that you sow. That's something that we owe. The tithe is 10%. The tithe is what belongs to God. We're returning it to God. But sowing seed is above the tithe. And he says that he will supply seed to the sower. 2 Corinthians 9.10 says, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. God supplies the seed. He says that he's going to give seed to the sower, not to the hoarder. See, many times people will cry out, God, give me seed to sow, give me seed to sow, give me seed to sow. And then you get a bonus or something happens and something comes in the mail. And maybe that's the seed that he's providing. But then we end up eating it. We end up spending it. When we get something like that, we need to say, OK, God, is this for me or is this the seed that I've been crying out for to sow? Because if we keep eating the seed, that we're hoarding. He doesn't say, the word doesn't say he's going to provide seed to the hoarder. He says he's going to provide seed to the sower. So how much seed are you sowing? You can most assuredly, if you're sowing seed, God's going to give you more seed to sow. And he will multiply that seed that has been sown. Glory to God. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Shall men give into your bosom. See, when we sow seed, then we know that we're guaranteed a harvest. So how do we, what's the process of prosperity? Well, we have to seek him first and then we sow. Another way, another process of prosperity is we save. There are 2,000 verses in the Bible on money, on how to handle money. And what does the Bible say about saving? Proverbs 6, verses 6 to 8. Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways to be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in harvest. The ant doesn't have a boss, and yet they store up. That's what he's saying. We need to save. They, she has no ruler. Then in Proverbs 21, 20 says, There is desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man squanders it. See, it's foolish to spend everything that we make. That's foolish. That's what the Word of God says. We get our paycheck and tithe and pay bills and then spend the rest on ourselves. No, we need to make sure that we're, we're saving. I heard my pastor say this years ago, probably 32 years ago, 10, 10, 80 plan, tithe 10%, save 10%, live on 80%. Oh, I could never live on 80%. Well, then we need to readjust our finances. Where's all that money going? Or maybe you feel like you can't do that right now. Let me encourage you this. Start, you can't, you, get, you can't shortchange the tithe. You gotta, you gotta tithe 10%. Maybe you can do the 10, 180, save 1%, and then gradually move up 2%, 3%, 4%, etc. in your savings. Don't shortchange the tithe because you're robbing God if you shortchange the tithe. Tithe 10%, save, save 10%, live on 80%. So we end up, the process of prosperity is we make sure that we're seeking God first, that we're sowing seed and that we're saving because the word of God tells us that we should be saving some aside. It's foolish to spend everything that we make. So we seek, we sow, we save, then we say. You know, it's so very important that we say the right words. Why? Because scripture says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it shall eat the fruit thereof. What fruit? Whatever we say is what we're going to produce. That's why we never want to say, oh, I never make enough money. Oh, I have more month than money. No, 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 brothers and sisters. We don't want to speak that. We want to speak words of life and say, oh, 
I have more than enough. I tithe, I save. And the, and the word of God says that he's going to meet all my needs according to his riches and glory. We need to make sure that we're saying the right words because our words have power and they're going to produce what we say. Look at what the example of Peter did. You know, they were out on the boat. They were fishing all night. And then Jesus comes along and they're washing their nets. Why were they washing their nets? Because they were done. They were not going to go back out fishing. And Jesus says, hey, what's going on? And the guys say, well, we fished all night. We toiled all night, but we didn't catch anything. And Jesus says, go launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a mighty catch. You know, Peter really could have copped an attitude and said, I'm the fisherman, Lord. You're, you know, you're the carpenter. What do you know about fishing? But this is what he did. He submitted to Jesus and he yielded and submitted to what Jesus said. He didn't have an attitude. He said, at your word, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to let it down. So they went and launched out into the deep, let their net down for a catch, and there was a mighty, mighty catch. Maybe some of you are watching right now, and maybe you haven't gone out far enough. Maybe you didn't let your net down in the right place. Go launch out into the deep. And you might be thinking, well, I don't know why the Lord would tell me to do that, because I've already done it. That's what Peter could have said. I was already out there all night, Lord. I don't know why you think I'm going to go out there. It's morning. The best time to fish is at night. And you're telling me to go out there now and the sun is out. He didn't do that. He said, at thy word, I will do what you said. I think sometimes the body of Christ misses it sometimes because the Lord gives us an instruction. We're thinking, well, I already did that. You don't know what you're talking about. No, we need to yield to what the Lord is saying and do what he said. And we, then we need to say and speak over our finances ourselves. So we know that there's a plan for prosperity. There's a promise of prosperity. There's a process of prosperity. And that process is that we seek the kingdom of God first. We sow seed. We save some and then we say, what do we say? What the word says. Yeah, we say what the word says. We line ourselves up into an agreement with what the word of God says. And there's a purpose for prosperity. Well, what's the purpose? Well, he wants us to enjoy it and he wants us to employ it. Look at 1 Timothy 6, verses 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. We see in this verse, we are to give, he gives us all things to enjoy. Listen, that doesn't mean that we get our paycheck and we spend everything on ourselves, but it doesn't mean that we have to be such a tight word and tight water and we never get to enjoy any of it. Uh, that means we can take a vacation we can buy a nice new living room furniture. We can update our houses. When it's time, we can trade in our car and get a different car. He's saying we can enjoy the fruits of our labor. He, you know, he set up the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve to enjoy it. He did put them to work and told them, hey, you got to work it. But it was for the, he made that place of prosperity for Adam and Eve to enjoy. Brothers and sisters, we, we have permission to enjoy the fruits of our labor. And then we are to employ it. He says, do good, be ready to give, willing to share, storing up. Well, how do we do that? Well, there's many things that we can place seed. 
willing to share, ready to give. Maybe you want to give to uh, to the a union mission close to where you live. Maybe you want to give to the poor. Local outreaches. Maybe your church has a missions fund that you can give to missions. Maybe you'll never go to Brazil. Maybe you'll never go to China, but maybe your pastor is going to do that. Maybe your apostle is going to do that. We can give to the missions. Uh, to the missions fund. Maybe there's a political party you need to give to. What's in your heart? What does God want you to do? Ask him. Why? Because in Deuteronomy 8.8.10 says, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant. How does he establish his covenant? It takes money. Uh, establishing his covenant because he wants other people to get saved. He says, you know, the Lord doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to come to everlasting life. And maybe you and I might not go to Spain. Maybe you and I might not go to Pakistan. Maybe you and I might not go to Africa, but maybe other people will and we can sow into that. We can give into that and it's if we're going ourselves and we're going to receive the fruit we're going to receive the reward of that because we gave to it. Yeah, glory to God. Proverbs 11.10 says, When the righteous prospers, the city rejoices. In other words, when the right people have the right things, others can benefit from it. And we can sow into that. In Proverbs 11.25 it said, A generous person will prosper. Today we covered a lot of ground. We, you know, the key to prosperity. We have the purpose of prosperity. We know it's God's will for us to prosper. There's a process of prosperity and there's a purpose of prosperity. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we see these keys today. I thank you, Lord, that each person listening and watching is going to walk all of this out in the name of Jesus. They're going to work the word because the word works in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to hear from you. Let me hear from you. Join me again next week on Money Matters. Thank you for joining us today. For more information about Karen or to get a copy of one of her books, make sure to visit her on the web at karenford.org. Join us next week for Money Matters with Karen Ford.